Jeremy Veldman, welcome to another episode of Telescope Tips. And once again, I'm here with Keith Latule. We're talking about all things astrophotography. Now, last time we talked about setting up a telescope, one of the telescopes that Keith uses for astrophotography. Today, we're gonna to talk about some of the cameras that he uses for capturing these images. So Keith, let's talk about what you got here now as far as the types of cameras that you use. Sure, um, so the, the big three on the market I think you're gonna find is the regular DSLR. Everybody seems to have one of these stashed around somewhere. It was kind of the camera that you used before the iPhone came out. Um, the next one up I think is called the CMOS. This is from ZWO. It is a cooled camera and it has a CMOS chip in it. So uh, this is really terrific for uh, planetary, some deep sky. It, it's not as, um, doesn't quite get quite that quality that you might get as you might from uh, the next camera. The next camera that we've got is a CCD camera. This is from ATAC and uh, does a great job of those really, really deep fuzzies and things you want to keep online for a long time. These two cameras are cool. Now, one of the things that happens, especially with the DSLR, is if, if you've turned it on, obviously you're gonna to wanna to keep that uh, camera lens open for quite a, a, a long time. What happens is the heat within the DSLR um, starts to kind of degrade, and what you'll get is you'll get some different pixels spots on your, um, your camera, or your, your, your picture. What you can do is obviously you can get rid of that or work on that, through the processing uh, software, you can take dark shots that'll show up and it'll kind of subtract it all out. But um, it, 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 you're gonna have it a lot less on either the CMOS or um, the CCD camera. Now, what I would suggest, and I know we talked about this earlier, is getting started in this. I'm, I'm, I'm a big proponent of a refactor, although I do not wanna sell some of the Smith Cathagrins or the um, newts or anything like that short. They are great scopes as well. I just, from my own experience, I, I, I just found that the, the refractor was a little bit easier for me. So, if you've got a DSLR hanging around the house <laughs> and you've got a telescope, and you want to say, you know what, I'd love to see if I can try it. A couple of things, um, you might want to make sure that it's got a bulb setting on it. Almost all of them do. And what that does is it allows you to push the shutter button, and then keep that shutter button open for an extended period of time, which is what you're gonna to wanna to do. To mount that, what you're gonna need is you're gonna need an adapter, and you're gonna need something called the T-ring that's specific for that particular camera. And in this particular case, all you do is put the adapter on like this, just screws on real quick. I'm gonna remove the backing here. And then on the DSLR, just, Put it on, do a quick twist, and then you'll slide it in here and tighten things down. Obviously you want to make sure it's tight Absolutely. before you let go of the camera, right? Absolutely. Okay. And, and, and my always, my, my favorite backup is find something that you can attach this to just to hold it on yeah. in case for some reason it pops off. Um, from this point, you could go ahead and turn the camera on, get a good focus with the rear viewfinder. Um, that would be great, it, it will work. Keep in mind though, anytime you touch this setup, it's gonna shake. So you gotta really be careful. Um, what you might wanna do is you can get an attachment that's either a wired or a wireless attachment, or if you've got a PC or something like that, that you can kind of get a, uh, for this particular one, this is Canon. I got something called EOS Backyard, which is a computer software program for the Canon, and it just wired into the computer, and you can sit on your computer and tell it everything you need to do. You're gonna to need to know um, what the ISO range is, how long you're gonna take shots. You'll wanna look at a histogram to find out exactly where you are on those shots. And, and all of that is gonna come into the works. There are a lot of variables involved in this. So um, that's the DSLR. Again, just same thing, just release it, bring it back. 
The CMOS is going to operate almost the same way. The big difference from the, on this particular one is I don't have a two inch adapter for it. So I have an inch and a quarter adapter for it. And all I'm going to do is screw it on the back side of it. Because it's an inch and a half adapter and this is actually a two inch, I need another adapter to kind of bring it down a little bit. So I'll put that on, make sure to tighten it down. And then what I'll do here, is take the inch and a quarter, put it on the camera, and make sure everything's tightened down real good and snug. From here, you have to have this connected to a computer. Uh, there's no way around it. You also need a power supply for the cooling mechanism. In it. So from this one, uh, there are a number of software programs that are out there. Uh, SharpCap is one that is, I think it was about $15. It was pretty cheap. There's also Fire Capture, which is absolutely free. And uh, New Velocity will do it as well. New Velocity costs about $100. Same thing, uh, it's set up on this particular one with the ATAC camera. It's that's the CCD, correct? That's the CCD, gotcha. right. Again, it's a cooled camera. It has a little bit better quality, although I don't want to start a big major no. argument with people. Right. Um, I like the CMOS and I like the CCD. Same thing, mounts here. Give it a good snug, make sure it's good and tight. Um, these are about less than a pound a piece, so they're not gonna put a lot of draw against your system, but you definitely wanna have the camera on there to balance it before you're gonna go out and um, polar line to do everything else. Just make sure it's all set up. Again, this one is gonna require a computer and a power supply to run the cooling mechanism. Okay, so now, if you're gonna capture, let's say, M42, the Orion Nebula, yep. or something like the Flame Nebula, yep. which of these cameras would you prefer and how long of an exposure are we looking at? Um, you know, I've had really, really good luck with the DSLR for Orion and Flame. And uh, I've set it up, just like we just said, and run it for about three minutes a shot. I took uh, 15 shots, and then I'll take uh, 15 dark frames and 15 flat frames. Now, a flat frame is going to be, you've got the camera all set up, same temperature, same focus, everything's fine, except you have a really big light source at the front, or a, a kind of a, a consistent light source let me say that and what that does the flat frame is looking for all those little nasty cooties that are going to be on your lens or maybe in your camera the little kind of dust mites that you get and what happens is once you get all these things you're going to take the darks you're going to take the flats you're going to take some bias frames which are really really quick and what they're going to do is look for the electronics kind of a maybe a little bit more of those pixels and electronics and you're going to take your actual light frames you put them in the software program it will crunch it all out it'll remove most if not all of those little fuzzies that are stuck up in there and what you're going to have is a nice picture with just your your deep sky image yeah very good so again you're talking about multiple exposures of anywhere from three to five minutes a piece and Absolutely. then when you're done, you're doing your post-processing on the computer right. to basically stack them all together. That's how you get those beautiful images that we're so used to seeing right. with uh, all the color and all the features. Now, you've done some galaxies also, I believe. I have, yep. Um, for galaxies, the, the DSLR is still a good camera to use, and I, I really like it. Um, you're definitely going to want to do some guiding because you're going to do a lot more time um, I like three minutes and 800 ISO. I don't know why, it's just over time, it's what I've just come to be comfortable with because at that range I can kind of adjust things and make sure I'm okay. Um, so galaxies I can still do pretty good with the DSLR. Probably a little better with the ATAC camera. Um, although I will tell you, and I wish we could get a picture of it, um, from sensor size, this is a the DSLR has a full frame, which it's it's a it's a bigger chip. The next one down is going to be this this particular CCD, and then the last one is going to be the uh, CMOS. Um, kind of hard to see, but I'll remove this if you can possibly see it. The little chip in there—that's the thing that's got all those little uh, 
collection buckets, I guess. So they yeah. collect all those. Hence the term time. charge couple device, right? Right. Yeah. Right. And these are the kinds of chips, of course, that you know the deep sky telescopes, the, the space telescopes use too. So Hubble's got one of these. I mean, we're we're in the silicon era, era now, so all the professional astronomers use essentially this type of technology. Now this is obviously a scared, scaled scale down. Slightly version, more expensive. But, yeah, slightly more expensive. <laughs> But you know, you can kind of see what we now have access to. So, yep. Anyway, thank you, Keith, again for showing us uh, the kind of cameras that you use, yes. and then also the aperture for astrophotography. But again, guys, I want to remind you that the Memphis Astronomical Society meets once a month, first Friday of every month at Christian Brothers University, Assessi Hall, room 155. Our meetings start at 8 o'clock p.m. And if it's clear, we do two dark sky observing sessions every month. In, a, in an area in northwest Mississippi, uh, about 45 minute drive from Memphis. If you'd like to learn more, our website is memphisastro.org. And if you like this video, please subscribe to our YouTube channel, youtube.com slash Memphis Astron Society. For Keith Latule, I'm Jeremy Veldman. Thanks for watching, and we'll see you guys on our next episode.